Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. This is a massive uh, turnout. We really appreciate it, especially with all the voting and the weather and things like that. Please, can you check that your phones are on silent very quickly? And you will also see, I think, during the course of this seminar, in your phones, an email pop up, which is our questionnaire, which we've asked you to do at the end, if that's the right thing on time. It takes 30 seconds and it's thrilling. <laughs> uh, oh, one other thing, emergency exits, the way you came in, in an orderly fashion. So, uh, for those of you who haven't met, my name is Simon Bettelson, I'm Managing Director of Metapraxis, and for those of you who don't know who Metapraxis are, we are a financial analytics business. And for those of you who don't know what financial analytics is, <laughs> um, essentially, essentially, well, we're very proud to work with some of the world's largest, most complex businesses. And our, our job is to provide technology uh, that helps the finance team extract from their data insights to help make faster and better decisions across businesses. It's a really exciting space to be in. Now, we founded the Tomorrow's CFO seminar series with the Charter Institute of Management and Accountants about just under, I think, five years ago now. And it was a pretty ambitious goal we built, and it was to help inspire what are a pretty conservative bunch on the whole, these finance individuals, to, uh, to take advantage of technology, of innovation, and of new ideas. Can I just ask you all to add, just take part in a very quick hands up poll? to generate a little bit of energy. So in this room, how many people do we have in finance roles or do you feel that they are a finance person? Don't feel shy to put your hands up. I know there's a lot of you who are to get this. Brilliant. Of those people, how many feel that your job is getting harder by the year? I definitely do. <laughs> be honest, be honest, be honest. And of everyone in the room, how many people of you truly feel that your organisations take advantage of technology and innovation? I'm so pleased you your hands up. I actually did have an option for if you all put your hands up, and that was to say, well, you've all been coming to these seminars, and that's why. Thankfully, you kept your hands down. That is essentially the, the purpose of these seminars. Thank you so much for your support, and, and please do um, keep coming. This, the theme of today, achieving exceptional performance in highly competitive situations, was really born out of our recent sponsorship of the Basket Match. Um, and, and at that, we were very privileged to work with uh, the startup Sportable. I believe the MD of Sportable is here. Founder, Doodle, please speak to Doodle later. Um, for the first time in the game of rugby, we put analytics and, uh, and technology, sorry, hardware together to give real time in, uh, analysis on the impact and speed in the game of rugby. And it was really, really exciting. It's technology we're really, really proud to be associated with. We think it have a massive impact on the future of management health, their performance, not just in rugby, but across many different schools. Delighted to have Dougal here today. We're also delighted to have Clive Woodward here today. Now, I would give you a, a longer introduction on Clive Woodward. So I'm guessing the likelihood is you're all here to see him, not me. So without further ado, instead, I will simply introduce Clive Woodward to the stage. Thank you, Simon, and um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you, Simon, for inviting me to your conference this afternoon. Um, first of all, it's clear, I, I'm just the warm-up back for Jacqueline and David later on, so uh, that's my main role. But I've got two main objectives. First of all, I ho hope you really enjoy this, this part of your day, and you feel it's well worth while coming to listen to the three of us. And, and secondly, I want to share with you my own personal views about this concept called the DNA of the champion. I guess most of you in the room know me best for that picture on the wall. I was, uh, Lucky enough to coach the rugby team for eight years, culminating in that kind of shot. Um, after that, I had a year in professional football. Um, and then I had seven years as director of sport at Team GB, uh, covering the Beijing Games, the Vancouver Games, and the London Games. But prior to all that, I had 16 years in, in Europe, which I don't think many people know. When I left university, I joined Xerox, ran Xerox. I worked for eight years, including five in Australia, where I was sales director. I very much moved into the financial arms when I was in um, Sydney. When I came back from Australia, um, after uh, eight years with Xerox, I set up my own small leasing and finance company, small brokerage. And we used to sort of take on, I guess, the many utilizing services in the big deals, the broken deals, um, which I also ran for eight years. And then lucky enough, my sport was the union, uh, went professional, and I was chosen the first full-time professional rugby coach. 
So the reason I give you a very, very brief CV, I promise you I'm not here to lecture to you or tell you how I think you should do things. I'm just going to take you through my views about what makes these champion individuals. Because I think there's certain characteristics that go across anybody, whether you're in the sporting world, the business world, the finance world, which most of you are into in today. And I'm going to just sort of um, just take through my whole experience of this, both in business and in sport. And then when we're with the panel, we'll have some time for some questions afterwards. As I say, I really hope you, you enjoy my uh, presentation. So, let's get into it. Joining the five on stage, first of all, we have uh, Jacqueline DeVrogas. I'm going to do my best to introduce uh, both, both of the panelists. Jacqueline is the president of Tech UK, uh, is non executive director of technology business Rights Move PLC, um, and also holds advisory roles with digital leaders and Accelerate HR. And I just wanted actually just to read a small snippet of Jacqueline's own bio, because I think it's very inspirational. Um, Jacqueline is a firm believer that the UK can seize its place as a digital nation of significance by attracting and retaining talent and demonstrating that it is a country open for business to the global markets. As a country that has just voted out of one of the largest global markets, and in the face of the particularly depressing campaigns I think run by both of the major political parties, it's nice to have some positive inspiration. <laughs> Brilliant, he is here, he was there earlier. Um, this, the, the final panel member is David Crane. David uh, is the uh, president of Financial and Risk, which is the largest of the divisions of Thomson Reuters. Uh, I think it's got 6.5 billion USD of uh, revenues across about 150 countries of operations. So it's an enormous uh, financial information business. Uh, but very interesting also, David is an advisor to the UK government on FinTech. Uh, and was also recently voted in the top 10 uh, leaders in financial technology in the last 10 years by an institutional investor. But far, far more importantly, David is an enthusiastic coach of the under nines at Wasps <laughs> Rugby. <laughs> so just before, just before we kick off on the, on the Q&A, there's a, a few rules of engagement. Um, the goal for this Q&A is actually to, to, to have some questions on the theme that Sakai has already talked about, but also to try to give two views, one from business and one from sports. Sakai has very kindly offered to give the one from sports, and I believe Jack and David are happy to give you views from business, although I'm sure these will, uh, the, the waters will muddy as we go. You also need to play your part, and that is you need to ask balanced questions that allow people from business and sports to answer. Uh, you, you, you sent through some fantastic questions, but I'm going to start with a bad example of an unbalanced question. Um, considering the high performance culture of the All Blacks and how difficult it is to tour in New Zealand, on what you've seen so far the Lions tour, do you think the Lions will suffer a series whitewashing test? <laughs> Very difficult to answer that from a business perspective. So please could you stick to some more balanced questions, and I believe the best example of being sent through actually is probably where we should start. Uh, I, I think, uh, again, there's, there's no, both those kind of legends of the cricket world. So it just shows you, you know, one, uh, one kind of captain and coach who created this culture of you know, everyone feeling very comfortable. Another, um, go the opposite way. I've decided to leave the second one, hence the little pressure. I, I, my, my experience this is uh, the top players perform well under pressure. And the more you can create the kind of the uncomfortable zone within the reason uh, just keeps everybody on their toes. I, I prefer to work in a little bit more uncomfortable. But when, our, our team room, for example, which we showed you on the board there, um, that was a pretty tasty place. Um, and we shut the doors, we had clear rules of engagement in that, and then, you know, within reason you can say what you want to. We wanted people really question, not only maybe each other about what we actually did. And of course, when you see the kind of the software we use, they start to get quite clear about what we do. You know, what happens when they're in school, what are you doing? So, we, I, I like an uncomfortable um, environment as long as everybody understands why we're doing it. And then when we walk out that door, we all walk out holding hands, we're very comfortable, and we're going to go the team. But behind the closed doors, it would be a pretty tasty environment, and just that's the best way to ask. And then moving into the world of business, Jacqueline. 
So firstly, I think success is always on the other side of fear, actually. Um, and I, I do believe that the magic happens outside of your comfort zone. Um, and opportunity is not always scheduled, is it? So uh, certainly I would agree with it. It has to be a bit edgy. David, any final thoughts? Um, I'm going to disagree. Um, but agree at the same time. So, <laughs> and explain. I think the best advice I give young professionals is to have as much experience as you can and learn different patterns and ways of solving things. What I have learned over the years is that more mature, experienced professionals tend to have learned how to do something in a very good way. And I would have agreed and I've tried many times to meet people in different worlds and different areas. And I'd say that more than 60% of the time that actually fails. So I don't want to be the boring guy. Um, but actually what I've learned, when it works, it works really well. But what I do learn is that people have characteristics and when they're in senior leadership, they've grown up with those experiences and learning patterns and way of solving things. And I do think you've got to be very careful. And I had one experience where I had a very, very good HR and a good example of that. Fantastic people skills, great in the real world the business put in charge of a business and, and it was the right thing to do and took a big risk, total failure. Um, now in, in sport sometimes as long as if you're a serious match you can get away with that, but this was actually quite expensive. And so just I want to play the, the conservative person in the room that says sometimes this might fail and be ready for the consequences. Sometimes it can be really good. Um, but I have learned over the years that, that people do solve problems in certain ways and become very, very good at that. And you can't always suddenly expect they're going to change 20 years of learning and suddenly do something different um, in the way that sport can you know, help you do that. Brilliant first question. So, show, show of hands, I've got other questions in here from you all, so I will pick on you if you don't show some hands. So, who would like to ask the next question? Big moment. Yes, thank you, sir. <laughs> The time scale of a sporting event is relatively narrow. You've got a certain period of time in which to prepare for a tournament or a match or whatever. In business, you've got long term strategies. Um, so I just wonder where um, the, the difference comes between um, being able to change your team and take players out of the team in a sporting context. In a, in a business context, changing your team is not so easy. HR legislation, you know. Small companies can't change the change their team. So I just wonder what your perspective is a good people are on that type of vision and difference in small business. Can you start with Jack? Yeah, so I've done a lot of um, transformations for US based software companies actually. And interestingly, transformation happens um, on the proviso, so you get enough rope to, to, to affect the transformation, but you have to still deliver the revenue within 90 day cycles. Um, so that what that means is, is that you have to be really super targeted about the changes that you make. And certainly, I found that you know, one of the things that um, I was talking about in terms of attitude um, is one of the biggest, uh, biggest uh, skills that I look for on my team, that's the biggest piece of DNA. And, and, and I have a, a rule which is, no passengers, no terrorists, no fundamentalists on my teams. And I mean that not in the terrorist sense of the word, but um, you know, there, there are, for example, people who the team doesn't want to carry and they're lazy and clearly either they kick up their speed or, or they're not off the team. Um, the fundamentalists are people who interpret the letter of the law and they're very black and white, and that's really tricky in transmission because you need creativity. And then, you know, uh, I think you absolutely need to make sure that you don't have those types of people um, on, on the team and, and that you've got people who really understand and, and you've given very clear instructions about what you want from them as well. Because that, that's what makes the team operate under pressure and within the 90 day return cycles that need the business. Because whilst a sporting event is short, actually a business event is also very short. Um, you don't have all the time in the world to transform business business form in my experience. Any other thoughts on that? You raise a very, there's a couple of questions hidden in there. Um, I was thinking as part of the speaking, you know, a match is a match. It's about 19, 18 in the period, and the match is done. 
Where is the work more natural and hard in every day is to do? And sometimes the work will not known for your best moments, you know, for your worst moments, and so it is. And so that level of play you have to be able to sustain when you've got a, when you've got a team of business performance. And sometimes success takes you know, a year, two years, three years, um, and you really have to work with it. Now, I think the equivalent of this sport is a tournament, because you know, often when you see a tournament, and what's happening? I think the winning side will not just be the best side, but will be the side with the best um, commitment through the tournament, the best bench, the best leadership, and sustenance to get them to the end. Um, and like you see that time and time again in the rugby tournament, <coughs> the team that's going to get to the end, the, the win is not necessarily the team that plays the best. Um, God help us. Are we going to coach it? Absolutely not. <laughs> if, if the HR rules apply to the team in progress, then you've got a real challenge. Just swapping people in and out, dropping them, substitutes, all those things, just isn't possible in business. You have to be far more thoughtful, deliberate, and careful about how you treat people at work, for good reason. Um, that doesn't apply so much in the, in the sport team, you just swap people out and go um, And, you know, we have, we have employees in half of the countries, and one of the things I'll find is I know the country versus the teams I can't, there's prizes for where the easier ones are versus the worst ones are. It's a really important mission for business, which is you want that flexibility to change teams around, to change roles, to change things that people are focusing on, and do it relatively quickly. And I would say that the UK is one of the best in the world. People have an attitude that change is fairly acceptable. There are other countries in the world, it's a lot more difficult, and the business side. Uh, I think the sporting thing is, um, I don't know if the sport's a business. You know, when I was really in the rugby team, it was a business. I was 50 on players, it was a business. There was times when I dropped players, I wish I had someone to make chat and sit next to me, because they were quite a tasty conversation, but then she actually went on. But I, I think, what I think you get into, I think over the, 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 my tenure of England rugby club, we've been a less of a turnover of players than any normal business would actually do. And I, I've sat in back and listened to people about turnover start and, and I think it's sometimes healthy but we need a certain percentage turnover that hasn't been too high. We also can't be too low. I think teams do turn players players over. But the secret to it is you, you do have to change a team. It's not easy just because in the sporting world clearly you're leaving players out and that's your decision. Um, but if you're leaving them out for, for reasons outside of playing reasons, then that it's really is quite an interesting Conversation. They move into the rock type scenario and then the sponge type scenario. But the turnover players are actually good. It's all looking and you and the players in. Because that was just putting pressure on the rest of the team. But I think you find if you look at it, there's not a big turnover you actually think of the day in the business. And, and that's how we operated. And uh, certainly the last two or three years, we didn't work up. It was probably any turnover too. That's what we actually did. Yeah, so really your question, um, sorry, please, so to read your question, because yeah, you can, you can, I promise you, there's so much out there, you can spend all day, uh, and I can just say what I do, I'm, I'm close to Formula One, you know, Formula One, I promise you, all sports lead, you know, so I'm, I'm lucky to be close to the Mercedes team, uh, the McLaren team, and the Red Bull team, you know, they're not totally confidential, but they kind of lead, and most sports kind of bring back on, on back of Formula One, so if we come up with an idea, I'm really sure you know, we've seen this, normally I've seen this, is it, you know, what does that happen to the house for? And of course with the Olympic Cup, so I know across all 26 sports, that works fantastic. You, know, you started to use, you know, from, from, you know, from the rowing team to the jetting team, you started to really bring technology in that they clearly thought would make a difference to so making the, the, the go to the logo go faster. So you, you've just got to do your absolute analysis on it, but you can get totally sidetracked. It's all back to my mind, it starts with talent, but once you've got the talent, this stuff doesn't apply. Once you've got that, you can find it, and make a real, a real difference. And that was my background, which I kind of loved. As I said, the secret of getting players token games. When you know you've really cracked it, the players are coming in and going, we heard about this, we heard about this. The stuff we've made, and I've actually heard about it before. David? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, I think it's been a while ago, it's been a while ago, it's been a while ago, just when the technology and the social media is doing the technology is starting to do things like that, to suspension, to monitoring. Incredible revolution in, in that side. I agree exactly what I'm trying to say. I mean, I have a rule about technology. Um, financial markets is a technology market, it has been for many years. 
the problem at the moment, which is very exciting, is there's a time change out there. Uh, streams of nature, uh, machine learning, and you name it, buzzwords in there. But a lot of it seems to me like a hammer looking for nail. And I think we've got to be very careful what is the problem I'm trying to solve, and therefore what technology do I need um, to do that. Now, there's a little bit of a license of you've got to have a bit of sort of screen that. Sometimes great new technology you come forward and you start thinking of possibilities. But my problem with some of the stuff is that it really is technologists looking for a problem um, to solve. I put blockchain in, in that category sometimes. Uh, and I think you've got to be really careful about wasting a lot of time on this stuff before you focus on the stuff that you really need to solve. And I'd say that as a, a company that is totally based on technology and information. Champion, there may be on both sides of the sales and yeah. technology. So, um, think about um, Britain as a curing nation. And think about two years ago when we would not have paid for anything under five pounds with a credit card. Why? Because there would have been a surcharge. And also, would we have um, tapped a card reader without thinking someone's going to clone my credit card? Now, you're in Starbucks, you queue up, and if someone even gets cash out, you go, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> or if someone dares to put their card on the card reader, you think, really? Um, so where risk overtakes convenience, that sort of pinch point is exactly the inflection point where technology starts to thrive and go viral. Same with the tube, you know, the ability to tap and tap out the credit card. It just goes viral when you've got that whole convenience piece and consumerization takes over. And that's the piece where you've got to look for where technology is really at its height. Um, and, and certainly in the finance industry, I think we've got a ton of technology coming our way. Um, in a good way, and also sometimes a little bit before it's time. In this country, we aren't yet um, as up to speed with regulation. Um, it's not keeping pace with technology. <coughs> Example, we've got driverless cars, but we haven't quite figured out whether we're comfortable without a driver. Because of where is the liability? So it's those kinds of questions that will hold us back, that are right out there, and, and it's all coming, and it's coming faster and faster. Thank you. Um, who, who, who for the next question? I have, I have some. Yes, please, made it back. Um, you mentioned about having data, data and analysis, uh, or analysis and um, using lots and lots and deep and going into the detail. Um, we're, a lot of us in the room, being finance people, love detail and love data, um, as does Arsene Wenger as an Arsenal supporter. Um, but, <laughs> Is there a risk that both businesses and sports people get too focused on the data and never actually take the next step from using that data? And what would you suggest is the right balance between the two? Yeah, I'll go first. It, it's it's, it's a, a very, a very good question. And, and again, I, I can, it's, it's just common, common sense. You can't overload uh, a player with too much data. It's going to drip feeling and drip feeling. Over a whole period of time, you know, and sometimes you've got to stop them because you've got out there, you've got to play the game, you've got to coach the game, you've got to do all the, all the fundamentals. Um, I have this very simple saying, um, what I call working in the business and on, on the business. I think champion people, athletes, coaches, business people, for 95% of the time working in the business and working with results. You know, if I lose four games of rugby in a row, I'm fine. We can have all this wonderful technology that doesn't actually work. So, 95% of my time is, is in, in, in delivering results, trying to win rugby matches, trying to win bottom line profit in, in, in the order. I think the secret is if you can spend 5% five time, five of your time working on the business, but you can just spend that half of the week or cover sitting back and looking at the bigger picture. And a lot of it is involved with new technology and all, all these areas and, and not overloading. So I'll be saying to the player, the player's never done any of this before, I spent 5% of your time every week when you start to actually look at this. And you don't bog them down and say, like, stop for a week or get involved. You just drip feed it in. And it's the 95 5 rule because, it's, you know, the gentleman there, you can, you can get totally bogged down with this. And suddenly you suddenly realize you've, you've lost test match, you've lost a deal, and it's all going very wrong because you're not working in the business. And you've just got to get that balance right. And I think it's 95 5. And if you get everybody in your team, from players to doctors to coaches working on that 5%, I found that's enough to keep it going. 
and making sure you keep ahead of the people sitting in those rooms. So, so. That's a different view. Well, I, I think you asked a really interesting question for the profession in the room. Um, and for every book that's been written about you know, the, the amazing power of big data and now for several books coming out about information overloading and, and slowing down, I think Malcolm Gladwell was one of the first to capture this when he wrote a book with that said, you know, maybe actually decisions made in the spirit of the moment are better than decisions made in the world of analysis and put up those arguments in a very interesting way and recommend you read it. I think for the finance community, and I have a big finance team, and I would say this to them as well, which is the finance professionals are in danger of behaving like the CIO professionals in the past. And remember we had those big information departments and we'd sort of send them a request and the next day we'd come back with an answer? Well, that's how green screens and IBM sort of mainframe technology used to work. Now you have Tableau and data analytics and all this data. And I think the finance team that's stuck in the past is putting their arms around it and saying, no, we control that. You know, we're, we're the source of data. I've had other people in my team say, no, if you want data, you need to go to finance. Whereas everyone else is saying, well, hold on, we've got all this data available to our, to our business. Let me add it. Let me do my own analysis. So I think finance has got to figure out what role it plays between the two of them. So I don't think it can be the custodians of all data and controlling that anymore. I think it's got to open it up and provide the tools and capabilities. And so that's a completely different role from finance in the past. I mean, you know, these are people from FQA. Uh, they're the CIOs of the past, isn't they? You tell me what you want to know, and I'll tell you the answer. I mean, they're our largest client base. <laughs> 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 these key clients are very welcome. <laughs> 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 what was the tool you've done in the process club for these guys? But, but what you've done is actually opened up sales forecast into a much wider community. So my biggest challenge now is I don't want to do anymore. I shouldn't, I mustn't. But there's a lot more people that can have access to that. And if they want to do things to their level analysis, call that. Right? You don't want to have a department of cooling houses and that stuff. I think the finance community, this is a really interesting problem to solve. Um, and their stewardship and governance around data is now becoming more important. Yeah, I just want to add, um, I believe that data is the new oil, for sure. Um, and I, you know, I think when I, when I look at companies like Google and Facebook, and they're scraping data from every single one of us um, every single second, um, they are like planets, uh, and they will control and influence because of what they know about us. So that ability to use the data we have in our companies to target uh, consumer experiences will set the companies of the future apart from those that choose to ignore it. Just um, interesting if you see, if you, and I'll get you caught up as I'll send you the seven posters. So what we did, we, um, and I think I hope this is answer the question, you know, and I, and I just did this, I, I, and this definitely came to my kind of business background, but I just broke it down to seven ends, so literally had seven posts and seven, seven boxes. And when we started this, we, and then what happened over time, we started to weight certain areas, and those posters were in order of importance. And the first one is just defense, yeah. you know, 40%, because we suddenly had at least seven areas that we started to look at actually how important is that to actually deliver on success? And those weightings became really important because that's how much time we spent in training, in team meetings, the whole thing. And it totally changed the way I thought by really analyzing and starting to understand the importance of these, of these areas. It wasn't a good case of, of capturing knowledge and sort of studying it. And we really started to weight it, and then everything was weighted, including the selection of players. You know, if you say, um, this is 40% of your game, can you really have some of the team who can't defend properly? Uh, and uh, basics, lineups, the next thing, and um, scrums, and that's been really important. So the whole analysis, we all just started in these seven areas, and we started to get the data of how much importance we, 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 we uh, expressed on that. With, without really studying the data of those seven areas, that would never have happened. Sure. And suddenly we started to be spending a lot more effective time on how we train, how we play, and definitely how we selected the team, in terms of who actually made, made the team. So, and I didn't know I was doing that when I first started off, because. You know, I was working out to an amateur, I was the first professional coach, so this was, you know, I expected to take the team to whole new levels because it was my full-time job, which I've never ever done before. So that made a big difference how we actually operated, and then all the players start to understand why we spent so much time on defense, for example, because that's what, how important all the, all, the, uh, all the analytics were coming up, that's, that was important to the team. So I'm totally back up what you said about basketball without, you know, I love basketball, watching it. 
defense is everything. Yeah. It's it's in the loop. You've got real data behind those 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 facts. Tony, I mean, two two things. There's many many analogies and things that are very valuable in school. Um, and this is endless. We could spend a lot of time. Uh, I'll give you two stories though from me personally. Uh, what I've taken. Um, so I inherited a business that was in real trouble. We had not shared for five years. Uh, we were declining at five percent. The share price had crashed. It was really on the right rails. And actually, the client came to talk to us pretty early in our in our turnaround. We left a real nasty memory of many people. Um, and one of the stories he tells is that there were these incredible Australians, which you know, everyone thought were like baby dogs and could never be beaten. Um, and it was a little bit like my team had the same mentality. We were competitors are just better than us. Our customers tell us they couldn't understand how we won. And one of his lessons was actually everyone's pretty much the same. I mean, everyone has the same basic intelligence, background, education. It's not like they're you know your competitor is suddenly high demigods. What's different is your preparation, your processes, the belief you can win, the investment in preparation. There's some confidence that you can actually do better than someone else. And it was a real aha, particularly for our sales team, who was really in the dumps on this, that actually even the mighty Australians um, could be beaten by preparation and planning. And it, and it really resonated with my entire team. They still talk about um, that experience. And we turn the business around and double the share price again, we're back in growth. The other personal thing I've learned is that um, uh, about three years ago, I was invited to be a coach at one of the minds of wasps. Um, and uh, flight's always been an inspiration to me. And I thought, well, maybe I'll learn something from this experience, even though I'm terrified of trying to control. You know, I managed 18,000 people, but 69 of them thought it scared the hell out of me, uh, particularly with their parents watching. It was the worst. Um, and the first thing I did was thought, well, I'd better get some training, because we had a brilliant RFU training course. And I expected to go to this training course and be taught the brilliant rules of, you know, when you run, you throw the ball to the left, you put it in, and all the kind of, I expected to get like the driving highway code of rugby, and actually what they taught me was about, this is about the kids, boys and girls, by the way, and creating an environment where they enjoy themselves, they're safe, they feel like they're learning and they're happy, and that's a real takeaway from you, which is, you know, as a leader, there's a lot about creating an environment where your teams are happy. And believe it or not, people don't turn up to work at a miserable time. Some of them may be doing, some of them say they are, but generally your employees want to have a good time. They want to learn, they want to succeed. And, if, and that was a real takeaway for me, which is it's less about instructing people what to do, and more about creating an environment where, where 18,000 people go home at the end of the day and think, that was pretty good, might not happen every day, but you know, if you get that right, and you get the belief right, I think that's the sporting learnings that I've had in, in my career. Yeah, I'm just going to say, um, so just my takeaway from sports in general, um, diverse teams, seem to do better, um, and it, it, that doesn't come much from sport actually, um, but certainly in business, diverse teams are much, much more productive. As an example, one woman on the board of a business can reduce the risk of bankruptcy by 20%. Um, and you know, when you think about that kind of opportunity we've got, then I think sport can learn a little bit from business as well. Um, but we need to do better in the finance um, community as well as uh, to be better represented right across the diversity spectrum. So last serious question. <laughs> How many hands are going to go up for it? Oh, yeah. Yes. Is there any word left for how I can Well, no, it's, it's, it's 30 okay. seconds. Um, I, it's funny, I was thinking about this as a question before you answered it. And as we were talking about, no. No, there is absolutely no way out of time. I mean, you know, our, our parents must have had a much easier time. Because I can't find anywhere to hide. In the same way you can't in school, you can't do business. I mean, you have to be better, sharper, on the game, etc. I and mean, it's a challenge. And it's a problem for learning because actually you want people to learn, make mistakes, and learn. You don't want to hide, but you want to feel like there's a lower risk environment. It's tough. It's really tough. We shouldn't really want to hide. Anyway, yeah. um, the gentleman at the back, you raised their hands up. Thank you. Um, I think the pendulum swings a lot in business. You have uh, businesses that go from outsourcing to insourcing, and diversifying, and specialising. Similarly, with people, 
There's often a desire to find the right temper of people who are good in the business and who's fit to perform. But equally, you know, from your point, Jack, about diversity, that's good. But how do you choose when enough's enough and you've got the real maverick potential in us, the, the, the Kevin Petersons or the Cipriano's of this world, where you do have to call time on their role? Um, back to my model. I, I, all, I always want to hire on talent. In other words, I'd want Cipriani, I'd want Peterson, and some of the two player you mentioned. So I, I want them, and I would be confident that as their coach or legal boss, that they would um, respond to what I'm trying to do. So, you know, we'd be using a similar sort of model. And to be clear, the England team that won the World Cup, and the Olympic team especially, was full of those people. You know, this, this wasn't a perfect sort of team, there was some real kind of challenge, challenges. But what I find with those guys was when you can be really from them, um, face to face, you explain what you're doing, and you want why you're doing it, and how you're going to do it, and they respond. I find often with the, if you call them Mavericks, they can call them, I can't like the Mavericks, because they tend to be really talented people. And you won't want to not hire someone who you know, have this kind of reputation. But if you do the kind of what, why, how, how well process with them individually, and you expect them to really respond. And I, I think you get these people as close as possible to you. In saying that, the moment they decide to cross you or they put a head, it's not like anything else. But to me, you've got to go over the top to make sure they really understand. And in my year in football, I was always amazed with these uh, sort of football players. The manager would always seem to think it's more to be a player. And he wouldn't be engaged with them because he was terrified of their agents and what we were next day and they just play football and that's when you get problems. So I, I just think, you know, I'd always hire on talent is what I can say. Um, but if they do cross you at some stage, they I can want to they 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 pretty good, they engage with them. And you know I'm a big Sabriani fan, I can't be the fan because they are the most talented people. Yeah, so uh, I, if you've never watched it, watch a TED talk by Margaret Heffernan. Um, it refers to super chickens. I don't know if anyone's seen it. But it's an experiment where you've got 100 chickens and 100 chickens. And it's easy to measure productivity of chickens because it's the eggs. Um, and when you look at um, what they did, so in this experiment they had 100 normal chickens and then 100 really high productive egg producing chickens. And they were, if you like, super chickens. And after 10 weeks, the 100 normal chickens were producing their 100 eggs a day. Happy days, la la land over there. The super chickens, when looked in at after 10 weeks, there were three super chickens left. Why? Because they pecked the other ones to death because they wanted to get ahead. And all I'm going to say is that you need to have a team environment where the super chickens don't peck the other ones to death. And it's, and it's very common. And by the way, we spend a lot of time, a serious point, creating businesses where we, we go out and specifically hire super chickens. So beware, that's a moment of things. Social cohesion is important. <laughs> the, uh, you're absolutely right. The, the pendulum has swung in a time of higher regulation, more control, frankly, more social responsibility of business and pressure on business. The pendulum is definitely swung against the, um, the matter. I would hire for talent, but I make this one point, which is what I've learned over the years, and I was a contributor uh, for several years, so this is interesting for a strategy consultant to tell is culture and strategy for breakfast. And if you're running a large, multi-global, complex organization, any misalignment, even a fraction of misalignment, the goal of the at the top, is magnified a hundred times. And I've learned that I've enjoyed Mavericks on my team, and, but I didn't really appreciate the damage until 12 months too late when I had to get rid of them. And when I got rid of them, I didn't appreciate the positive impact that had in the culture of what we can create. So absolutely get talent, but be aware that you're in a fish bowl, there is nowhere to hide. And, and misalignment is different from maverick or exceptional importance. I think your point about you know, too many times in business people think the competition is inside. Right? And competition is outside. Inside. But you'd be amazed how many people wake up every day and think, oh, you know, John and Jeff and you know, I really want to prove them better than them. It's incredible, but it happens. And getting rid of that is extremely important because it's very, very destructive in an organization. It happens 
far more than you can to, to getting a two in his mind or you know, one thing about sport, the goal is to raise that cup at the very, very clear goal. Getting a two in the mind on that is absolutely Thank you. That, that is the end of the, the audience questions. I know you're all waiting for here, the drinks being arranged. I, I won't get out of here alive if I don't ask, ask the panel specifically to supply just one more question. And perhaps it's two questions hidden. The first is, 24th of June, who starts at number 10? What is the series result? Uh, only Farrow starts at number 10. So no, uh, only, I've changed the lines. I thought it would be Sexton and Farrell, but I think it's... Uh, Farrell play well at the weekend. And then you go to Saturday's game is huge. It's um those are the it is it with Lions making a bad start, they've actually put a pretty tasty team for Saturday morning. So it's a great matchup Saturday morning because the Crusaders it is a full test. Um, if the Lions can win that game, they're fit to win the team, all the full bets change and we can win the At least Saturday if it's a bad one, it's gonna be a long one to talk So uh, Farrell start, I think the Lions can will win Saturday and go in the test series too. <laughs> <laughs> Patriotism, probably the way to explain that. 2-1. Backed up by all the most sophisticated data. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.